say you don't know why I'm doing it. Good evening, everybody. A pleasant good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our weekly gathering at the Dapper's East Restaurant at 2901 West Addison Street. The College of Complexes has been meeting weekly since 1951. The format the college has basically two rules, and I think we all know what that is. The first is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Uh, right. The format of the college is as follows. The first, we're going to have a brief announcements period. Then we're going to have our main speaker, who is Patrick Stevenson. Then we're going to have a question and answer period, and this is where you have actual questions and not statements because at the end of the question and answer period you will get a chance to say your piece with our infamous rebuttal period. Stevenson, who's employed in the banking industry. He's going to be talking tonight about Bitcoin. A cryptocurrency is a medium of exchange like normal currencies such as United States dollars, but designed for the purpose of exchanging digital information through a process made possible by certain principles of crypt crypto cryptography. Crypt cryptography is used to secure the transactions and to control the creation of new coins. The first cryptocurrency to be created was Bitcoin back in 2009. Today are, there are hundreds of other cryptocurrencies often referred to as altcoins. Put another way, Cryptocurrency is electronically converted into lines of code with monetary value. In the simplest of forms, cryptocurrency is digital currency. Patrick Stevenson's a well-known friend of mine. He's a member of Toastmasters International and has recently hosted our last con fall conference. You can find, if you go onto my website, his hosting abilities at www.tim's video. Just again, click on the uh, District 30 video and look at him up at the fall conference. Anyway, let's welcome Patrick Stevenson. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Tim. And I'm gonna do it one more sound check. I'm assuming the speaker's coming across for everyone. Fair yeah, enough? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. All right, good. <clears throat> Charles, I didn't get a chance to meet you. Thank you very much for putting me on the agenda. And after you talked about how you're booked for the next four months, four and a half months, I'm pretty lucky that I got in here in early January. So very I appreciate lucky. you all. Very lucky. Yep. So timing is right. And <laughs> yeah. I hope you enjoy the show, the show tonight. Tim told me this is a pretty quiet crowd that just doesn't speak up much, so... Uh, uh, no, I, I got it wrong? That's, that's not the way it is? No? All right, well, <clears throat> the intro might have given away some of the answers to the first questions I'm going to ask here, but I'm going to talk about this thing called Bitcoin. And even though I've been working in the banking industry myself for 14 years, when it first came out, I didn't know what it was, and I thought it was some strange thing that was going to be a fad or some experiment just disappear, but it didn't. It kept growing and living and surviving and getting bigger, and eventually I thought, man, this thing's been around and I still don't know how it works. Once I got to know how it worked, how it's being used, it actually made a lot of sense to me. And I'm not going to get into cryptography and all the mathematics and other elements in there, I'll touch on those just because they're a part of it. But I hope I can share with you guys what it means and why it actually might change the way we handle money in not only the U.S., but around the world. So I've got three main things I want to cover tonight. I want to talk about what Bitcoin actually is a little bit about how it works, and then a little bit about at the end about what it means for the future. And you'll see that I'm really going to form my topics as questions. Do I have a question in the back already? No, no. Oh, got I'm it. Trying to get the sound low. All right. Oh, the the music. Yeah, it's nice accompaniment. I hope I uh, I hope I harmonize no, well. well. Well, well, I'll get it turned off. So I'm going to say, very simply, as you heard in the intro, Bitcoin is money. Now there are a lot of flowery, wor flowery words that I heard Tim say, cryptocurrency, digital this, digital that, but in the end, Bitcoin is money. 
just like any other kind of money. And it, money is more than just paper dollars. If you think about it, money can be coins, can be gold, can be silver, but money is money. The only reason we have money is to exchange it for something else. You don't live off your money. You live in the house that you bought with your money. You live off the food that you buy with your money. You wear the clothes that you bought with your money. Money is nothing but storing value so you can exchange it for something you can use. And now we have this thing called Bitcoin. But what makes Bitcoin different than these forms of money on the screen is that Bitcoin is nothing you can touch, nothing you can put in your pocket, take it out and hand it to somebody, have them give it back to you. The only place it exists is inside computers. You may see images of coins looking like Bitcoins with the letter B on them. Those are imaginary. Those are pretend. Bitcoin is only in the computer world, pure and simple. So that's why we call it a digital currency. You heard Tim say the word digital currency. Well, it's digital because it's only inside computers. Now, I'm going to ask if you've ever heard of a digital currency before, and actually just curious, would anyone say they've heard of a digital currency before tonight? Credit card. See, I, very good. A couple examples. I would say you're pretty close. Most people, if you've ever made a reservation with hotel points, or airline miles, or rental car miles, or you've used the points on your Capital One card, or credit cards, those are digital currencies. You exchange them for stuff that you want, they're a currency, but they only exist in the digital world. There's no money or coins you can pull out to use your United Airlines miles. It's only at United Airlines computers. Bitcoin is the same, same form. Now here's a couple things that Bitcoin is not. It is money, it is digital, but it's not plain money. When I first heard about it, I thought it was like plain money. I thought you'd never use it for anything serious, but it's real money. You can't get it without spending real money, and you can use, as we'll talk a little, you can lose, as we'll talk a little later, real money with Bitcoin. It's also not a credit card. Credit cards are for evolving lines of credit. Bitcoin is money, just like cash is money, just like gold is money. Okay, Bitcoin is not the same as a credit card. And it's not the same as a stock or a bond. You'll see the price go up and down. You'll see it compared to all sorts of other currencies and change every day. But it's not a stock or an equity. It is money. What else is it not? And this is probably the biggest thing that Bitcoin is not. And the main reason it was even invented. It is not a fiat currency, if you've ever heard that term before. <coughs> And if you haven't, well, I'm going to tell you anyways. If you take 20 bucks out of your pocket, you give this paper to somebody else, you will be giving them $20. Why is this worth $20? The only reason it's worth $20 is because Uncle Sam says it's worth $20. Damn it. That's it. There is no other reason this is worth $20 other than by fiat of the U.S. government. Deutschmarks, francs, euros, yen, yuan, rubles, rupees, all of those are fiat currencies. And they're managed by a central government. And the people that invented Bitcoin wanted to create a currency that was not managed by a central government. So who does control Bitcoin? If there's no government, no fiat, who is controlling it? Well, in one sense, no one is. It's out there by itself. It's a global phenomenon. There's not any one single group or organization or government or company that is managing Bitcoin. But in the other sense, everyone is controlling it. And in that regard, it's like a commodity. Oil, oranges, wheat, gold, those are commodities. The price goes up and down. There's no government that controls the price of those, but it is the market that controls the price. Bitcoin is a market-driven currency, very much like gold. So what does that mean? The price is set by the market, as I just said, and you can see the price go up and down every single day. You may have heard the news recently when it was over $1,000 per Bitcoin. Now it's back around 900 
but it changes every single day. There's actually a limited supply of Bitcoins. Now this may seem strange in the world of computers, where you can copy a song, or you can copy a picture, or you can copy a file or a document 10 or 100 or 1,000 or a million times. But the way Bitcoin was created, there will be a limited amount of Bitcoins in the world. It's not infinite. As I said, there is no government control. Like any commodity, the market decides what the price of it is, not the government. Supply and demand, plain and simple. And there is no central authority whatsoever. There's no company, there's no person, there's no group, no trade group, no consortium like OPEC. It truly is a market-driven commodity. And in that sense, it has been often compared to gold. And you'll often hear the phrase, digital gold. Because other than gold being physical, Bitcoin being digital, everything else is very similar. Everything I just put up here applies to gold and to Bitcoin. So how much is it worth? You just heard me say a couple of numbers. One Bitcoin, as of the way, as of right before I drove here, was worth 900 US dollars, a single Bitcoin. A couple of weeks ago, it was worth over a thousand. Last summer, it was worth about 600. Eight months ago, it's worth, worth about 400. It is extremely volatile. But if over the past six years, seven years, from when it was invented, you can see the chart has gone way up and down. And you'll see one peak in 2013, that took place about the time the conflicts in Crimea were happening between the Soviet Union and Ukraine. Everyone was flocking to change their rubles into what they considered to be a safer currency. And every time there's a financial crisis, the country of Greece was about to collapse and possibly take down the European Union. Bitcoin shot up in price because people wanted to get rid of their Greek currency and have something that would be usable in other countries. As I just said, when there was the conflict in Crimea, when the Chinese economy took its downturn a couple of years ago, that also caused people to flock to Bitcoins. And this past summer, when Britain threatened to exit, when they actually exited the European Union, Everyone wasn't sure what was going to happen to the euros, so they converted their euros into bitcoins. And recently, a couple of big governments have started to put out currency controls. You may have heard that the country of India and the country of China have started to end use of high-value paper money in those countries. And so citizens are converting their cash into bitcoins. So every time there's a major economic crisis or surprise or downturn, more people convert their money into bitcoins. So a little bit of history. Where did it come from? And I've mentioned this a couple of times. It came out of the fact that someone decided we needed a form of currency outside of gold or silver that was not managed by a government where interest rates weren't subject to a government, where mistakes were not subject to a single government or a single chairman or reserve CEO. And to actually add to the mystique of Bitcoin, no one actually knows who invented it, except the person that invented it. And he or she or they go by the, no, the name Satoshi Nakamoto. You may have heard that name. That's the author of the white paper in which the idea of Bitcoin was conceived. But no one actually knows who it is, and a few people have claimed to be Satoshi, but they've never been able to prove it. And there have been a few people who have claimed to be Satoshi, but then backed down and said they did not want to prove it and didn't, didn't want to disrupt the currency and didn't want to cause trouble for whomever, so they recanted. He could be in this room could be in this room right now. In fact, that comment is just the kind of comment that Satoshi would make. <laughs> 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 
So it did come out in 2009. It hasn't been around a dozen years, a hundred years, hundreds of years or centuries. It is extremely new. And everyone thought by 2010 or 11 or 12, it'd be an interesting experiment and it would be gone. But that hasn't happened. And it has only gotten bigger. I said a moment ago that today a Bitcoin is worth $900. If you want to get a Bitcoin, you will pay, you will exchange 900 US dollars. In 2009, when Bitcoins were first created, the first exchange was 10,000 Bitcoins <laughs> for two pizzas. And it has grown exponentially ever since then. And yes, there are people that were involved in creating Bitcoins in the industry and the operation that are multimillionaires now. Absolutely. So I mentioned this notion of a central authority. I wanted to clarify that a little bit. I've thrown a couple words around governments and so forth. A government is absolutely a central authority when it comes to currencies. But all of these other companies that we deal with on a regular basis are central authorities. When you pay somebody something with your credit card, well, your bank is the central authority on that. And if there's a disagreement between you and the person you paid, the bank will say, this is what happened. I'm the authority on that. Same thing if you transfer money using Western Union or buy something with your credit card at a store. So we deal with central authorities all the time. And Satoshi Nakamoto, whomever he is, wanted to have a currency that was outside of the control of companies and people that could make mistakes and not manage it as well as simply the general population could manage it. Now, one of the things that people often don't realize about a central authority, and one of the reasons that Bitcoin has not gone away, it's sticking around, is because central authorities are costly. Their job is to protect the privacy of all the transactions. Their job is to protect the security of the transactions, make sure no one gets in and plays around with history. If someone went in and updated the history of your bank account to show that you had no money, well, that would not be a good thing. But banks do a pretty good job of making sure that does not happen. But there's a cost to banks doing it. Same thing with credit card companies, same thing with money transfer companies. Their job is to protect the data they hold. And we are mandated, our government has mandated that these organizations also do a great deal to prevent, thro prevent fraud and identity theft. As an employee of a bank, I'm extremely impressed. And I have been ever since I, I joined the banking industry at really how much is done to prevent fraud. There are a thousand different ways to detect whether someone is trying to do something they should not do. And it's extremely advanced. But it's very, very expensive, too. It's a cost we pay regardless. Now on the flip side, <clears throat> why is Bitcoin not costly? If you think of the three factors I just described, well, when it comes to privacy, one of the premises of Bitcoin is that all of the transactions are simply publicly available. Don't even try and hide them. I can go out tomorrow and I can download the entire history of every transaction that's taken place in Bitcoin. And so can you. And so can anyone in this restaurant. It's completely open and to the public. So no security vaults to pay for. Bitcoin also has a mechanism to make sure history is never changed. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. That is one of the scariest things, to find out that you thought you had a million dollars or a thousand dollars or something in between your bank account and somebody changed history and no longer you, now you don't. That is a technology called the blockchain, which you may have heard about when you hear about Bitcoin. It's the technology behind Bitcoin, and I'll touch on it a little bit to explain how this actually does a lot for security that we pay a fortune for inside financial institutions. And finally, when it comes to fraud, Bitcoin has actually a very solid way to make sure no one ever spends a Bitcoin without being the true owner of the Bitcoin. It's very hard to steal your identity and spend your Bitcoins. So now that I've talked a bit about what Bitcoin is, how it's different from other money, how it's the same as some money, where do you get it? 
And this is a, how I felt a few years ago. It came out, it was this secret computer money that only certain people had. And I honestly thought, well, the only place you're going to get it is from somebody you really didn't want to be talking to to begin with. Some stranger on the street who wanted to take your hard-earned dollars and give you these magic beans called Bitcoin. And then I just extrapolated that thought and said, well, why would you, even if you got some Bitcoin, how would you spend it? Well, you probably want to spend it on something that you shouldn't be spending it on to begin with. The only people that need Bitcoins are people that are in, into arms dealerships. Or if they weren't in the arms industry, then they probably wanted to use it for drugs or something else nefarious. So A, I thought you don't want to get Bitcoin because you're just going to be dealing with people that want to take your money from you. And B, the only things you can buy with it are things you probably shouldn't buy to begin with. But the more I learned about it, the more I learned how legitimate it actually is. There are a number of exchanges which are well-managed money institutions where you can go to exchange dollars or yen or euros or won for bitcoins. No different than exchanging any other currency. Most of us deal with a foreign exchange every day. It's our bank. Most banks in the US are foreign exchange organizations as well. And of course being digital, well, most people are going to use Bitcoin. They'll download an app to their phone and they'll do all their transactions through their phone. And I'm guessing most of us in this room do our banking by our phone nowadays too. The Fed actually predicted in early 2015 financial traffic over phones would exceed financial traffic over desktop computers. And sure enough, that's actually what happened. As of almost two years ago, there's more finance going on over phones than there is through any other channel in the world. And as it stands, there's actually Bitcoin ATMs. And this happens to be a, a company, Rocketcoin, based in the Chicago area. In between Chicago, Metro Chicago, Metro Milwaukee, there are Bitcoin ATMs, just like US dollar ATMs. Now, spending it is actually still growing. It's not as easy to spend as your, your hard-earned US dollars are. You can't go to any restaurant like Dapper's, or you can't go to any online place like HomeDepot.com and just buy stuff with Bitcoins. You can go to a few, and when you see one, they'll usually have the Bitcoin merchant logo on their site. And some sites that we may recognize are starting to accept it. Overstock is starting to take Bitcoin. And I expect over the next couple of years, you'll start to see the major retailers online accept it, followed by the, the smaller ones. So that's still an area where Bitcoin is growing. Now I want to touch on some of the technical side of Bitcoin. I'm going to keep it very high level, uh, but I think it's, it helped me to really have a lot more confidence in Bitcoin. And I hope it helps you guys to understand really what makes Bitcoin tick. I mentioned it was a digital currency before, and it's actually also called a cryptocurrency. And we'll talk a little later about other cryptocurrencies. But this is what makes Bitcoin actually a safe thing to transact with, not some fly-by-night mechanism that's going to take away your money. And ironically, the technology behind Bitcoin has been around for decades. This is one of those rare instances where the genius is not inventing something that never existed before. But the genius is actually taking things that have existed for a long time and figuring out a totally new way to use them. And there are three technologies that really are combined to make Bitcoin work. One is called a hashing function. And it's a very special mathematical function. Normally, if you see a simple math function, A plus B equals C, well, if you know what C is and you know what B is, you can go backwards and figure out what A is. Reverse engineer the mathematical equation. This is a type of math function where you can't do that. You may know the formula, you may know the outcome at the end of it, but even knowing that, you cannot work your way backwards and figure out what the original numbers were. Another piece of technology called a cipher blockchain. And you will hear the short form of this simply called blockchain. 
And if you hear that term today, you're hearing someone talk about these three technologies really combined. Um, are we at a no. hard stop? No, we're not at a hard stop. Okay. Just a message. All right. So when you hear this term blockchain, which you will probably hear more and more in news and media and, and other forms of communication, really it's a short form of talking about all these three things combined. And then finally, this notion called a public and private key pair. And again, without getting into exactly how it works, you use these just about every day you use the internet and you may not be aware of it. Whenever you go to Amazon.com, or BestBuy.com, or Google.com, or Yahoo.com, sometimes you'll see this abbreviation, HTTP. And if you don't know what that means, you probably have seen that in your internet browser. And sometimes you'll see a form of it, HTTPS. You'll see that letter S on the end. And what the S simply stands for is secure. And the way these websites that we deal with are secured is by using public and private key pairs. So we use them every day when we're on the internet doing something, buying something, checking our bank balance. It's just behind the scenes. And it's also behind the scenes at Bitcoin. Now, in order to actually make a currency, so we have these weird cryptographic technologies, in order to turn them into what we would call as a, a currency and actually have people trust it, there's a few things you've got to take care of. One, ownership. If I have a coin or a dollar bill, well, possession in this case is 100% of the law. I've got it. You don't have it. I've got it in my hand. Tamper-proof history. I talked about that a few minutes ago. I'll talk about that in a moment. Making sure that every agree, everyone agrees on what the transactions are. If you don't have a central authority like your bank, how do you get everyone to agree who traded money with whom? If there's any dispute whatsoever. High reliability. You don't want the entire, entire history being lost because your computer had to restart, as the one in front of us just threatened to do. And finally, you have to give people an incentive to have, help support this. Now, we give merchants and banks and all sorts of other organizations an incentive to support dollars because every time we spend a little bit of money, part of that money goes to everyone it took to put the money network together. Part of the money goes to the credit card company, part of the money goes to the bank, part of that goes to the network between that's tying all those together and the, at the end of all that, whatever's left over goes to the merchant that you just bought something in. So there's a huge supply chain when it comes to money. And with Bitcoin, how do you incent people to actually support Bitcoin to use? So I mentioned a few of these things public and private key pairs, the same way that you know when you go to Amazon.com that you're actually dealing with Amazon.com and not somebody pretending to be Amazon.com is how people identify themselves in Bitcoin. Well, if you have Bitcoins, you can only spend it if your idea is used to spend it. It's an idea that you will have unique to anyone else in the world. Just like Amazon's idea is unique, just like Best Buy's idea is unique, just like Bank of America's idea is unique when you go on the internet, Bitcoin uses the same mechanism. And that idea is, is a public nickname. How do you enforce ownership? Well, I'm sorry, I think I have a typo in my, my label there. This is actually uh, talking to how you make sure the history never gets changed. And I'm going to talk about this metaphorically. Think of a jigsaw puzzle where each piece plugs into only one other piece of the jigsaw puzzle. If you want to change one of the pieces in that chain, suddenly it doesn't connect to the pieces around it anymore. So if you change that one piece, that means you're going to have to change the piece next to it. So, and then suddenly that piece won't change the ones next to it. And you have to change the entire chain of transactions in order to change something in the history of the transactions. Am I able to go? So that's how Bitcoin says if somebody did something a year ago, there's no change in the history because you'd have to change everything that happened from a year ago up till today in order to do that. Now how do you get people to agree on what was actually done? 
and again, I, I don't want to get into the math behind it, but two people can obviously just create their own histories. And one will say, well, this is my history, and one will say, well, this is my history, who's right and who's wrong. And the way they solve this with Bitcoin is to ask each of those people to solve a mathematical problem. And the only way to solve it is by doing some mathematical work. And the first one to solve it actually gets to have their version of history become history. And every 10 minutes around the world, people are racing to solve these mathematical problems. And every 10 minutes, one of them is chosen as the winner. And that person's version of history is the one that becomes the real history of Bitcoin. In the next 10 minutes, some other, someone's going to add more history to Bitcoin. And every hour, six people or groups add 10 minutes of history onto the Bitcoin history. But they're only allowed to do that by solving these mathematical problems. And what that means is, if you want to go back in history and change it, you not only have to <clears throat> change history on people's computers, but we have to solve the same history of mathematical problems that everyone else solved in order to build that history to begin with. And it's a concept called proof of work. You all know how easy it is to erase something on your computer. Now, I, I can't be the only one that has ever erased something important on my computer. <laughs> and I'm guessing all of us have at some point or another. Well, with Bitcoin, with the history being available around the world, it's almost impossible to get rid of the history of Bitcoin. And in order re to replace it and solve all these problems that have been solved for years now, six an hour, which means about 140 per day, which means about 5,000, I'm sorry, 50,000 per year, there is not enough computing power in the world to go back and solve all those mathematical problems. That is how Bitcoin says our history is not going to be tampered with. Because there aren't enough computers in the world to tamper with it. And if someone were to try and do that, as they're going back and rewriting history, the rest of the world is still making new history. So how do you ensure this reliability? I just mentioned a moment ago. Okay, what happens if somebody loses their history of Bitcoin on their computer? Well, there are thousands and thousands of computers around the world that have this history on them. If anyone loses it, nobody cares. If any 100 or 1,000 of them lose it, nobody cares because there are hundreds of thousands of computers that are all supporting the Bitcoin history. It's not just a couple of people in their garage. So that kind of begs the question. You have thousands and thousands and thousands of computers all being used just for this currency. Why would anyone set aside their computer to do that? Well, interestingly, what the creators of Bitcoin decided to do is actually give those running the computers the Bitcoins. So when I talked earlier about 10,000 Bitcoins being exchanged for a couple of pizzas, those Bitcoins were created in that transaction given to the people that supported the transaction, then they had 10,000 Bitcoins worth about two pieces at the time. But every 10 minutes, as someone solves these mathematical problems that I described, <clears throat> they're given a handful of Bitcoins. That's their incentive. And it started out very high. 10,000 was the first increment of Bitcoins handed out. And it's gradually dropped over time. Every few years, it gets cut in half. And just this past July, six months ago, it was cut down to 12 and a half bitcoins. So right now, every 10 minutes, 12 and a half new bitcoins are created out of thin air. And in about the year 2040, that'll be the end of bitcoin creation. And at that point, there will be about 21 million bitcoins in the world. So that's where the comparison to gold comes from. Eventually, we will mine all the gold that we can mine. It'll get harder and harder to find as time goes on. Same thing with Bitcoin. In four more years, it'll be 6.25 Bitcoins given out every 10 minutes. So right now, if you're lucky enough to solve this mathematical problem before anyone else does, 
you will get to write 10 minutes of history into the Bitcoin history. You'll get 12 and a half Bitcoins, which are going to be worth, worth roughly $1,000. So every hour, about $6,000 is paid out to run the Bitcoin network. So every day, 6 times 24, about $140,000 is paid out to run the Bitcoin network. So that's how everyone around the world is incentive to actually help out. And like I said earlier, the people that helped out in the early days, when the handouts were in the hundreds of bitcoins, well, are now multi multi-millionaires according to the current value of a bitcoin. <coughs> so I've talked a lot about Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is not the only form of currency like this out there. It's one, and it is by far the most prominent one. And if you ask me, it's really going to be the only one that survives a long time. A lot of people think Bitcoin is, is like a strike of lightning. This person or group, Satoshi Nakamoto, had this wonderful, interesting, genius idea. But once they published their idea, everyone else decided, well, I can do that. I just have to write some computer software. And sure enough, there are literally hundreds of these cryptocurrencies. And I've just put a small handful of them on here. And they come by all sorts of names, Ethereum, Dash, Ripple, Litecoin, and you may hear about them in the news or read about them in magazines. And some of them were created to be a little bit different from Bitcoin by uh, on purpose. For example, this one called Ripple, well, it claims to be a lot faster than Bitcoin. I mentioned a few minutes ago that it takes 10 minutes before the history is recorded for Bitcoin. And that happens six times an hour. That means if you go buy something, you give someone your Bitcoin money and they give you something in return, it's not actually recorded in history until up to 10 minutes after that exchange. Normally that's okay. If you're making a deposit in a bank account, it gets recorded 10 minutes later, overnight, nobody cares. If you're sending money to a buddy of yours overseas or across the country and they get it even a day later, that's no big deal. But if you're paying a restaurant for a sandwich and you're going to take it on the road and go and you give them 10 bucks for a sandwich and then you drive away, but the restaurant doesn't actually get that money until 10 minutes later, they don't know if that transaction is good until you're long gone. So that's clearly not acceptable for a point of sale type restaurant. This company called Ripple created a currency that claim claim will confirm transactions in just a matter of few seconds. And their goal is to have a digital currency suitable for the restaurant and quick sale merchant industry. So one alternative. <clears throat> Another one of these cryptocurrencies called Dash. Their claim is that the transactions in their history are anonymous. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that any of us in this room can go download the entire history of Bitcoin transactions. For the past seven years, I can get everything that's ever been given from one person to another in Bitcoin. What that means is that if I spend money in Bitcoin, well, somebody can see that history of my spending it. And some people don't necessarily like that. For example, if you have, if you look in your wallet right now and pull out a dollar bill, you have no idea, as your mom used to say, where that money has been. It could have come from a bank two weeks ago, or it could have come from a drug smuggler in Florida two months ago. There's no way to know. That's the essence of cash. There's no history of that dollar bill that may, means anything to anybody. All they care about is the fact that you have a dollar bill. Yeah. Well, with Bitcoin, the entire history is there, whether we like it or not. And this company called Dash created a currency where they will jumble up and randomize the distribution of the coins every so often so that the history is not traceable. That's their differentiating fact. And there are others. If I go back, I'm going to back up for just a moment here. A couple others here. Ethereum, another big one. They claim that their cryptocurrency allows you to actually set up what are called smart contracts. And that's a whole topic in and of itself. But the idea is to allow people to apply contracts to the currency to simplify contract management. For example, if you, could, if you paid your rent in Ethereum, 
you could set up a contract between you and your landlord that automatically pay a thousand dollars or whatever your rent is on a monthly basis for as long as the lease was in place. Simplifying and taking fiat and all the costs out of contract management. Most of these currencies have one little factor or other that will differentiate them, but none of them by far have a critical mass or adoption that Bitcoin has. So why do we care about Bitcoin? Most people aren't familiar with it. Most people have heard about it, but haven't used it. Well, just a few numbers. Right now, I mentioned that Bitcoins are eventually going to be stopped, going to stop being created. And at this point, there's about 15 million of them in circulation. And circulation being a digital circulation. By 2040, there will be 21 million, and that will be the end of it. Right now, a Bitcoin is at about $900 per Bitcoin. That means the market value is about $13.5 million. That's on par with most mid-sized companies. That's no small thing. And if the growth continues as it has been, and we get to 21 million Bitcoins, you know, it could, Bitcoin could have the market cap of some of the largest companies in the US in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Hundreds of thousands of transactions per day. Not just 10 or 20, not just 1,000 or 2,000, hundreds of thousands. Those are the numbers you need for a critical mass. Bitcoin, like it or not, is not going away anytime soon. Another reason Bitcoin is making a difference. All of us have heard about spin-offs from NASA. Drinks, healthcare, clothes, technology. If we had that space program, there are any number of things that we may have never seen because they were created for the space program. Well, a moment ago I mentioned this technology and I walked through at a very high level, hash keys, private pairs, cipher blockchain, all these cryptography techniques. Well, now that Bitcoin has taken hold, banks, Insurance companies, healthcare companies are all trying to figure out how they can use the same technology for other purposes. The same technology to manage vehicle titles or land titles. Part of the cost behind these titles is the fact that they have to go through all the same security measures I mentioned for money. Privacy, fraud, security, those are very costly protections. And they could be treated the same way as Bitcoin it could perhaps be a lot easier to manage ownership of real estate, cars, artists who create songs and artwork and paintings and so forth might have a much less costly way of managing the rights to their work. Today artists have to go to record labels and among salesmen, bankers, lawyers, the people who run record labels are not always people you want to deal with either. Now, as altruistic as I've, I've been in talking about Bitcoin, how I've talked about it does this better, it does that better, it's safe, it's secure, it's going to change the way we deal with money, it's going to become a part of our life in the future. There are a few things that need to be looked at for Bitcoin and any cryptocurrency to be successful. The biggest thing, in my opinion, is that it is created by software developers. Same people that write games and write software to manage money and control the devices in your house. Well, now they've created software to manage cryptocurrencies. And it's not as though if you have a dispute with your neighbor over a transaction or a dispute with something you bought at the department store, you can't just go back to Visa and say, hey, I'm not satisfied, I need my money back. This is all in software for, so to speak, the software is the law and that's it. The U.S. government, not to be a representative, but from what I've seen and read, is working very hard not only to fully understand the impact of cryptocurrencies, but also to use it in their work. And I saw a very interesting panel, uh, including several people from the FBI recently. They were able to use the Bitcoin history to trace down several cases of money laundering. So this public 
availability or works both ways. Right, right. It does allow you to be somewhat anonymous, but that entire history is there for anyone to see and use. In another element of the cost of managing money that I didn't mention before, I saved it till the end here, but I'm guessing you're probably familiar with this abbreviation FDIC. Anytime you sign up for a checking or savings account, you see FDIC insured. And probably of several of you can tell me, all that means is that if the bank goes under, the federal government will make sure that you get all the money that you stored in your checking account or your savings account. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Doesn't exist for Bitcoin. So that's something that will likely have to be solved before Bitcoin really achieves ubiquitous acceptance around the country and around the world. And there have been instances where money has been lost. Just last year, one of the Bitcoin exchanges lost several million dollars when they were hacked. Also earlier this year, a company called Bitfinex went under because they lost on the order of $70 million worth of Bitcoins. Their security was breached, the money is gone, and there's no way to get it back. And they aren't even the biggest one. A few years ago, a company called Mt. Gox lost, <coughs> excuse me, over $100 million in Bitcoins at the time. And if they had held on to that with the rate of increase of Bitcoin value, that would be worth approximately $300 million today. That was its value in 2011. So Bitcoin is not foolproof. And really, you're putting your trust in the exchanges that deal with, with Bitcoin. And one of the other currencies that I mentioned just a moment ago, one called Ethereum, they almost lost about $150 million worth of Ethereum earlier this year, when one of the smart <coughs> contracts that I mentioned wasn't written quite right, it wasn't as smart as it was supposed to be, and someone was able to use it to withdraw about $150 million worth of Ethereum coins. That's a lot of money. That's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. It is, and it was a huge, huge ordeal in the cryptocurrency money, industry. Yeah. And this is why the fact that this is controlled not by government, but by software developers and entrepreneurs becomes a factor. Because what the developers behind Ethereum did at the time is they modified the Ethereum code to actually simply take that money back. It was money managed by software, and they used software simply to get it back. There was no court involved, no government, no investigation. All the things that we expect to be safeguards around the transactions we live with on a daily basis, they aren't there when it comes to cryptocurrencies. So I think I've talked quite a bit. I want to give a chance right now for things that I can tell you guys that may not have added up, things I could have touched on that I didn't, or anything else in the cryptocurrency industry. All right, thank you. All right. Yes. All right. And yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Patrick, can you turn the mic off? We're running out of battery power. I can. It'll, it'll be four cryptos. Um. All right. And I'm going to turn off. I'm going to turn off. Go ahead. What's your question? Uh, with Bitcoin, uh, what would stop the government at any time? They, I mean, for instance, if you have gold or silver. You can put it in a bag and you can go. Uh, you could uh, jump on a plane or, or yep. go to Mexico or whatever, and you have the bulk of your assets in a little bag with you. But with Bitcoin, what would stop the government from, for instance, uh, uh, making machine access computer access to bitcoins impossible by shutting that down? Uh, good question. Um, and, and actually, I think my response to your question will probably become part of my presentation going forward, because I, I think that's very relevant. 
there have been actually a couple of governments that have tried to do that. Uh, one of them, uh, the Chinese government, which extremely conservative, as we all know. And in the early stages, they had the same concerns and thoughts, competition for their own currency, and it was not allowed to interact with Bitcoin. Ironically, <clears throat> it, it's now not an issue in China. Uh, perhaps not because the government simply acquiesced and said, okay, we can't prevent it, so we'll just live with it. <clears throat> But I talked a little bit about this whole concept called proof of work a little bit ago. And because of this mechanism behind Bitcoin, one of the reasons it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to go back and goof around with history is because you need to amass an extreme amount of computing power to do so. You're really competing against a network that is global. And <clears throat> as it turns out, the cost of running such a network is, is extremely high. And the cost is not driven by the cost of computer parts, chips and keyboards and screens and so forth. The cost is actually driven by the cost of electricity that it takes to run the computer. That's what the cost of Bitcoin is being driven by. And of all the nations in the world, the one nation where electricity is the most affordable happens to be China. So all of the activity I was talking about to create bitcoins and solve these mathematical problems, well, of all of it, a large majority of it is taking place in China because of that. So, uh, Sir, uh, if you have, um, like I said, if you have a bag of gold <coughs> with you virtually anywhere in the world, you, it will be acceptable for money. Uh, you're mentioning about electricity. Well, I remember just before Ronald Reagan became president, before the election, uh, there was a bad situation with air traffic controllers, and you, you couldn't fly because there were no air traffic <coughs> controllers. They were on strike. And um, if there were a power outage like uh, New York has been known to have, you wouldn't have access to your Bitcoin. But if you had your gold in a bag, you'd have access to it immediately. So uh, aren't these good reasons not to use Bitcoin? A uh, couple of points in there, a couple of good reasons, and hopefully I can touch upon them. You actually recalled a very interesting uh, event right before Ronald Reagan was elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, a good friend of mine, his older brother, was an air traffic controller at the time. And uh, you, you probably watched uh, Johnny Carson uh, a time or two when he was uh, the, the MC of The Late Show uh, for NBC. And at the time all the air traffic controllers were on strike, he did one of his great Carnag episodes where he puts the envelope up where he's got the answer, he reads the answer, and then you find out what the question is. And he reads the answer. Happy, dopey, doc, sleepy, grumpy, bashful. Opens up the envelope, pulls it out, reads the answer. Who's running the flight control tower at LaGuardia Airport? <laughs> so I remember that strike very well. <laughs> as far as gold goes, I think there were two notions you touched upon there. One is, what if the government tells you you can't do this anymore? And number two, what happens if the network goes down and you don't have access to your bitcoins? I think the government's in a situation a lot like prohibition back in the 20s and 30s. The internet is ubiquitous. All of us have a cell phone. All of us have a computer connected to the internet. And even if you somehow shut off access within the US, traveling anywhere in the world will give you access to it. And it's almost impossible to shut down access to something like this. So I think the sheer difficulty of trying to block access to Bitcoin would make it a law that was almost extreme, unenforceable, if not totally unenforceable. As far as carrying your gold around goes, you point out some of the practical benefits of gold. If there's a power outage, that's not going to affect the gold you have in your bag or your pocket. And if you leave the country, 
you can take your gold with you and it's still gold no matter what country you're in. But you may find that you're up against some of the other drawbacks of gold. Number one, if you want to use it, well you've got to go someplace that's equipped to actually exchange gold for something else. They have to have a scale, they have to know the value of it, they have to protect it. So you have to either deal with merchants or exchanges that know how to help you convert your gold into food or rent or water or clothes or whatever you want in place of that gold eventually. So while gold is great as a store of money, it still needs to be converted into something that can be used when and where you want to spend it. The risk on Bitcoin is yes, power outages, network access, with the reliability of the grid and the ubiquity of access today, that is a drawback. I would consider it a low risk, but it is out there. It's, it's hard to say it doesn't exist. Tim, I've been a couple on, questions here. Sorry. I've been on the dark web a few times. Mm -hmm. There's a browser on there. It's called the Tor Network. Mm -hmm. And when you go into the Tor Network and say you pull up a site called the Silk Road, yep. you sign in with a login and an ID, it's just like eBay. But they only accept Bitcoin. Correct. Why would... Why would trying to be anonymous, but yet you say the history is all ah. there for everybody to see, why would uh, dark web sites use Bitcoin? So let, it's a good question. Um, I was alluding to the Silk Road. It's not the only piece of the dark net. There's, it's probably the most prominently known, and the people that are behind the Silk Road are probably not so happy that it's gained as much visibility as it has. <clears throat> But in the early days of Bitcoin, that was a large majority of how Bitcoins were spent, is through sites like the Silk Road. And exchanges that supported those kinds of transactions got in a lot of trouble, and were put under a lot of heat. Nowadays, the exchanges that manage Bitcoin in the U.S. are under the same constraints that banks and other institutions are for the U.S. government. So it's not as easy to use Bitcoin as it used to be. However, one of the reasons the Silk Road does uh, use Bitcoin is that it does have what is, is more correctly called pseudonymity. Everyone uses and spends their Bitcoin under a nickname. So you spend Bitcoin under your nickname. It might be Superman, or it might be Joe2520. It could be anything, just like nicknames you use to log into websites. So when I say the entire history of Bitcoin is available, the entire history is available, but it's only available with nicknames. Now if I find out who, what your nickname is, if I know that Joe2025 is actually Tim, then I know how Tim has spent his money. The trick is in finding that nickname. And that's a lot of what the FBI will do. They, will use, they can get the history of transactions if they think Bitcoins have been used for money laundering, they'll latch on to the transaction history in Bitcoin. And if they can find out the person behind the nickname, then they have evidence for their case, and they have done that. And I think that's good thing. It's, but it's what we call pseudonymous, not totally anonymous. So your privacy is as good as the privacy behind your nickname. Is. So, so that means the recent few packs of cigarettes I bought through the Silk Road, through Bitcoin, in trying to avoid taxes might still come back to haunt me. If someone can figure out your nickname, it could. <laughs> uh, theory, if, in theory. I don't know that it would be worth the trouble to figure out your nickname for that amount of taxes. <laughs> now, if it was a few million packs, then it would probably be worth it to figure that out. <laughs> but it's up to you to keep your nickname <laughs> private. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure it was first. He was. Good, good. All right. My questions are as follows. First, the Russians play games with bitcoins like they seem to do with everything else. Two, do, 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 do terrorists use bitcoin? Okay, I'll, I'll tackle both. And last question, what is the Silk Road? Okay. Uh, oh, so did I, did I answer your thoughts on the Silk Road or do you have a second? No, I, I want to know what it is. What it's for. Oh, what it is? The Silk Road is one of the more prominent sites for the illegal merchandise. Uh, it's called the Silk Road, a homage to Marco Polo making That's his travels to the yeah, eastern yeah. countries uh, hundreds of years ago. It's called the Silk Road. They would travel east. They would come back with all the silks and the spices and so forth, hence traveling the Silk Road. And it was the moniker adopted 
by an organization to fund international illicit activity. Okay. So your first two questions were, what, what can the Russian government do? And your second question, you have to remind me. What are ter what, what terrorists play terrorist games with okay. this? What so as far as the Russian government can, uh, being able to tamper with this, that's actually where Bitcoin shines. Again, it's because any one organization who is trying to tamper with the history or the ownership of or the creation of new history is going to be competing with the computing power of everyone else in the world. And it is such a large network that it would almost be impossible for any one single government to amass enough power to upset the balance of managing this. And there's actually a special attack on Bitcoin that alludes to this. It's called the 51% attack. So since everyone's competing to solve mathematical problems, if there's 10 people competing, all with the same computing power, well, then they each have a 10% chance of solving the next mathematical riddle. So every 10 times, it's going to come around to them. But if one of those 10 people could get as much computing power as the other nine combined, well, then they'd be able to write the history every other history. And if they could get double the amount of computing power as the other people combined, they could be writing the history two-thirds of the time. So they would have gained the kind of power that you're alluding to the, to the Russians there. So that's referred to as a 51% attack. If you can gain more computing power than anyone else, hence 51% of the computing power, you could influence the history of Bitcoin, but no single organization is anywhere close to being able to have that and having the funding to be able to do that. As far as the use of Bitcoins in funding terrorism, I can't speak from empirical evidence, uh, but everything I know about money laundering, funding terrorism, and so forth, both from my own career and from what I read, I have no doubt that at different points in time, unfortunately, Bitcoins have been used to fund terrorist activities somewhere along the supply chain, whether training or supplying or actually executing some event, but I couldn't point to any actual use there. Okay. What about using uh, serial numbers on these coins? I mean, to see a hundred million dollars being lost out there, ah. there's only so many people using it. Can't they trace that? So ah, good. They can trace it. Uh, the issue is not necessarily tracing it. The issue is getting it back. Yeah. That's okay. the problem. Uh, serial numbers is an interesting concept. Um, Bitcoins, they are digital. And I refer to them, I use the word Bitcoin in singular and Bitcoins in plural, as though there are individual Bitcoin entities floating around in the computer world. But in reality, a Bitcoin is simply an amount at any one given time. There's not necessarily a serial number attached to each Bitcoin minted. Bitcoins are divided up and redivided up. As, you, as I mentioned, right today, a Bitcoin is worth $900. If you want to buy a sandwich for five bucks, you're not going to give someone a Bitcoin. You're going to give them a very, very small portion of a Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin network is set up to allow Bitcoins to be divisible down to eight decimal places. So, a, I believe it's eight, uh, that eight decimal places is one ten billionth of a Bitcoin. And there's actually a name for that. It's called a Satoshi in, in honor of the, you know, the <coughs> pseudonymous <coughs> inventors of Bitcoin. So if someone says they will give you a Satoshi, or even if they will give you a thousand Satoshis, well, they're giving you a <coughs> fraction of a fraction of a penny. But Bitcoins themselves do not have individual serial numbers. They get divided and redivided and redistributed and added back together. So when someone spends Bitcoin money, they really only simply have to prove that they have collected enough Bitcoins in order to give you whatever they're giving you. Just like regular coins, in order for me to give you $5 in coins, all I have to do is show that I have $5 of coins in my pocket. Quarters, dimes, nickels, if they add up to $5, I can give you $5 in coins. So. It is traceable, but there's no way to force the owner of the money to give it back to you unless perhaps you can figure out the name behind the nickname. And that's where law enforcement's luck has to go, is figuring out the people behind the nicknames. Um, Charles, I think you're ahead. Yeah, Patrick, I, I simply do not comprehend this 
six mathematical problem arrangement. It has no utilitarian purpose. I don't know who's making up these problems. Okay. But I, in a real world, with your feet on the ground, this is some sort of arbitrary and capricious abstract you know exercise which in the professional world is 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 not this doesn't I can't figure out okay. the utilitarian purpose in a very utilitarian financial world. You know, uh, these have been just outstanding questions and I can already see uh, I, what I need to add to help illuminate things going forward. But yours right there, Charles, is probably the, the one that I appreciate the most. <clears throat> I, I use the example um, of solving a math problem and a type of math problem where even if you know the answer, you can't go back and figure out the inputs that went into that answer. That's the type of math problem we're talking about. And <clears throat> There is a good example that I would like to start using, um, but I, I didn't bring uh, one with me. But everyone's probably familiar with the, the little lock, the master lock, where you have a dial. It's the type of lock you had on your locker at high school. You turn it three times, three, two turns to the right, combination lock, three to the right, three to the left, three to the right. You've got to go to the, the right three numbers, right? If you know your combination, it's super easy for you to unlock that lock. It takes you five seconds to unlock a combination lock. If you don't know the combination, you can still figure out the combination, right? Who can tell me how you figure out the combination to a combination lock? Keep trying. Exactly. You keep trying until you get it. And if you have a lock of 36 different options, it's 36 times 36 times 36 <laughs> possible combinations. So you have to try it possibly 36 times 36 times 36 ways. And if you actually find the combination to that lock, then either you knew it to begin with, or you did the work to find it. And that is the way this mathematical problem works. It's like a combination lock where people know the answer, but don't know the combination that went into it. And if you guess the combination, then I know you did all the work necessary. It's busy work, nothing but busy work, but I know you did the work. And therefore, I allow you to set the history. And for anyone to change that history, they've got to go back and redo that work. And after the history becomes an hour old or a day old, they have to do that work six times for an hour or 140 times to change a day of history. So it's purely busy work. Yeah. And that's why the concept is called it's proof of stupid. work. It's only to prove that you've done the work. And so in order to change history, no. you've got to do the same amount of work. And that's where the computing power comes in. Yeah. That's why the Russian government cannot change history, because they do not have enough computing power to pick that lock thousands and thousands of times Security. that it would take to change history. Uh, I, I, um, I saw got Bob's got hand. I got comment oh, that. sure. It's also a way to create <coughs> counterfeiting. Like if you make money hard to make, it's like it's hard to counterfeit it, so you true. know it's it, true. It does add okay. to the effort Security. up front. Yeah. Yeah? That's a part of it. So, and, and the, the coin I mentioned called Ripple, they do it differently. They don't use that method, which is why they're able to do things in three to five seconds as opposed to every 10 minutes. But there's a lot of question about whether that's really a reliable way of safeguarding the history. Yeah, uh, to be sure, uh, am I correct in understanding then that Bitcoin is not an official legal tender and therefore uh, it's not really money? A uh, couple questions there. So is it really legal tender? That's where the U.S. government and all governments are trying to well, catch up. Wait a up. minute. My question really is, well, I, yeah, well, if ahead. somebody ahead. said to me, I'll buy your car and, and I'll pay you in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. I have the right to say I'm not interested. I don't accept Bitcoin. Totally. Yeah, and most people do not. Most merchants do not. It's the exception where you can spend Bitcoin. Most Bitcoin is simply people exchanging money with each other to share money over, over dinner. And one of the big uses of Bitcoin is people working in the U.S. sending money back to their families in India or Mexico or wherever they may be because today 
if they want to do that, they use Western Union or they use their bank, they pay a large fee to send their earnings back overseas or wherever. So that's what's giving Bitcoin a lot of its momentum. But you're totally right to not accept, or to, you are totally within your rights to not accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. If you, if you refuse to accept US dollars, then you're refusing to accept our legitimate currency here in the US. So is it legal tender? I would not say it is. Is it allowable for exchange? The government hasn't said no. A lot of people fear that someday the US government will say no, like other governments have tried to. But I think they've just decided, just like prohibition, it is going to be too difficult to tell people not to use this. So there's nothing to prevent me from using Bitcoin, but I certainly can't force Bitcoin on you. Yeah? Um, a slightly um, off-topic question. Do you, if France leaves the European Union, do you think the euro will um, survive? And if it doesn't, do you think they're going to go back to individual country currencies, or will they go to cryptocurrency? Uh, two questions there. On your first one, actually, I think my, this is totally my personal opinion as far as the future of the economy goes, which uh, that and, you know, a couple dollars will get you a cup of coffee. Um, I do think if France does decide to leave, I think that alone won't lead to the end of the euro, but I think it will actually add to the momentum of countries leaving, and eventually I think if France does, I think it will continue the domino effect. Uh, if, if it stops at Britain, I honestly think the European Union and, and the euro will be fine. Uh, but it, France being another one of the big players, I think that will lead to <coughs> other countries leaving, which that will be the end of, of the euro. I don't think they'll go back to individual currencies. I don't think the cost of maintaining individual currencies was one of the reasons they all centralized on the euro to begin with. And I think there are other reasons other than money management that caused England to leave the Union. It was more trade relationships than currency management that led to that. Um, I don't foresee something like a cryptocurrency being the alternative there. I think it would be a long time before governments abandon their own fiat currency because it gives them A, a lot of control, and B, it's also the safeguards that the majority of the citizenry want around the currency. So as much momentum as there is behind Bitcoin, there's still a lot of reasons to have the security measures that I mentioned up there. I do think France would start a chain that will be difficult to stop that if they decide to leave. Go ahead. In the event of a financial crisis, similar to the two thousand seven, two thousand eight, what are the pros and cons of Bitcoin? Uh, let me think about that one. Let me. I'm just trying to tie Bitcoin to a crisis like that. The reason I think want to think for a moment is. The crisis then came about because of a couple of different things that are not necessarily related to currency. If you remember what was happening in 2003, 4, and 5, and 6, real estate was skyrocketing. Everyone was looking to invest in real estate. Everyone wanted a second home to rent it out as an investment, whether it's a home, vacation home, whatever. That was at the grassroots level. At the larger level, you had countries like China wondering where to spend the money they were now accumulating and investing it in U.S. real estate and real estate around the world was considered one of the safest places to put it. And large tracts of real estate would be securitized and sold for those purposes. Uh, also, <clears throat> a lot of mortgages were being handed out without the proper due diligence behind them. Proper, property values were overinflated. Home inspections and appraisals were shoddy, so you could get a $500,000 mortgage on a $200,000 house and claim that from an investment purpose, this house was worth $500,000. So that created the real estate bubble. That's what led, I think, to the financial crisis um, of 2007 and 2008. That was the trigger that led to it. I don't know that Bitcoin would have would have helped or hurt much in there. The one benefit in Bitcoin would be for those that actually had their money in a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin outside of the fiat currencies, they wouldn't have been subject to the huge devaluation of currencies around the world because of the financial crisis. 
So that, I think, is, would have been the one benefit. I don't think Bitcoin would have done anything to forestall the financial crisis, though. The causes of that were, I think, different enough. Yeah? Uh, Can you speak up, please? I believe um, Bitcoin had a, or received a mortal biblical wound. In fact, I thought that they were on their back. I, I couldn't understand what was going on, but I thought they were going to go out of business. Oh, excuse me. So the, the question, if you, if you didn't hear it, was <clears throat> a couple of years ago, uh, there was thought to be something that hurt Bitcoin and hurt it badly enough to actually lead to its demise. But it's still around. Did that happen or what was it? And my guess is that you're thinking about one of the events that I put up on the screen here when <clears throat> a couple of the exchanges that actually convert dollars to bitcoins or euros to bitcoins for people, those are the crises that have taken place is with the exchanges. And when those have happened, when the Mt. Gox crisis took place, when the Bitfinex crisis took place, both of which I had up on here, one for 70 million, one for 120 million, those exchanges absolutely went out of business. Nobody would do business with it anymore. They went under. And the value of Bitcoin went way down after those events. People lost a lot of trust in Bitcoin because they lost trust in the exchanges by which you had access to Bitcoin. So those were major blows to Bitcoin, but certainly didn't lead to its demise. I can only think that those are the events that you're thinking of. So, oh. so it, can, it can have a crash just like the stock market gets a crash? It can, if you recall, I could go back to the slide, but it had a major rise in 2013, followed by a huge drop after that. It went down to less than half its value, which, it's, which would be a crash by any definition in stock market terms. So it has had a crash, I would say, but that was only after an extremely meteoric rise. I, I just uh, make it as briefly as possible. Sure. How do you, how do you make a, 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 your signature to the computer being original? Ah, you actually use a tool for that. There are special software tools that will create what are called these keys. And I showed the picture of a couple of skeleton keys, but that's, you know, metaphorically what they are. You get what are called two mathematical keys, and a key is simply a long string of letters and numbers. That's what a, a crypto key is. And you get two of them. One of them you give other people. It is a unique key that only you have. Actually, both of these are keys that only you have. One of them you give out to other people and say, this is my nickname. It's not as fun as Joe 2025. It's more a, a long mathematical number. And that is what you use to say, this is what how I'm identifying myself whenever I spend bitcoins. The other of those two keys you keep and you do not share with anybody. And the way they work is they, they match up with each other mathematically. So I know if I see what is called your public key, that you must have your private key to have given me that public key. I almost forget my uh, username. So yeah, this is not the key you write down and just keep it on your wrist or your notepad or whatever, it's a key that you have to use a program like the one I showed to manage for you. It's not a key you keep in your head. Yes. So, so if somebody, okay. If somebody steals that key. If somebody steals that, it's, it, and it, it, we use the term wallet, you keep these keys in your wallet, a digital wallet, and if somebody steals your digital wallet, they've got access to your money. Yes. Yep. Uh, you talk about the the value of Bitcoin keeps going up. How does that? Well, it goes up and down, but generally it's gone up. So, th so that doesn't cause a deflationary spiral where how can you spend a Bitcoin if a Bitcoin might be worth so much more in the future? That's uh, actually, it's caused people to hoard Bitcoins. People will hoard them because they believe. And right now, you know, the transaction amount is still in the hundreds of thousands. So that hasn't, the hoarding effect has not been enough to stem the use of it simply for living and doing business. If for some reason, like gold, people decided I'm gonna hoard it and wait till it goes way up and nobody spent it, that would put a deflationary uh, pressure on it. Just hasn't happened yet. And hopefully it never will. Okay, along those same lines then, if the, the amount of Bitcoin was capped, like you were saying, It was a magical years, number, 21 million so, Bitcoins. So what yeah. happens if 
this does become a international currency, then, then then there's too little of it to be functional in a uh, larger. Good question. Um, you know, we're using an international currency, uh, just to be yeah, sure. True. You know, we're uh, yep. like let's say a lot of. Things are yeah, I wouldn't call it ubiquitous yet. You can't just walk into Walgreens and spend Bitcoin. So it's not ubiquitous, but it does exist. People have access to it everywhere. So yeah, what happens when we reach this cap of 21 million Bitcoins? It's as though the US, you know, US government made 21 million silver dollars and no more silver dollars, for example. That's why they made a Bitcoin divisible to eight decimal places. And that's why you may, you know, a long time down the road, start spending things like Satoshis, because Satoshis will grow in value. The idea is that the value of Bitcoins will grow once they get, once there's a cap on the creation of them. But really you never spend a whole Bitcoin, you spend fractions of Bitcoins. Oh, okay. So the value of the Bitcoins will theoretically continue to grow. So the, okay. the, 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 the cap is determined by the mathematics? Of, yes. of the, the, uh, it's it's not necessarily a mathematical cap. It is a constraint that is put into the Bitcoin software, and it is possible if everyone around the world can be convinced to make an update to the software to allow the number of Bitcoins to grow beyond 21 million. You would have to get a consensus, a global consensus, though, to do that. And the idea is that it would be extremely hard to convince everyone around the world or a majority of Bitcoin supporters around the world to actually do that. So there is a cap written into the software of 21 million, but that's a fairly arbitrary number. There's no magic around that number. It was just to have a cap in principle. Okay. Um, maybe a couple more questions and then we'll get into a rebuttal period. Uh, any? I don't know, we might have gotten to oh. yeah. We well, say hoarding. When you hoard it, you just keep it in the, in the computer. You, you keep it in your wallet. Or Never you spend know. it. Yep. Yeah. Just you just hold on. Yeah. Hold on to it until the value yeah. goes up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there are people and entities that are, are doing it as the value has gone up. It's not necessarily a, a currency for day to day, you know, buying your daily living transactions. Simple food, gas type. Yep. Yeah, have you seen the movie Banking on Bitcoin? Or, uh, I have yeah, not, and actually I'm not aware of it. Now I have to look it up. Yeah, it's, it's playing at fast. Yeah. Oh, you're it. kidding. I'm going to see it tomorrow. Oh, gosh. What's the I'm movie? Not, I'm definitely going to have to look it up. What's the movie nice. called again? The four, ten, uh, Would you repeat the name of the movie? Can you repeat the name? Banking on Bitcoin? Banking on, uh, banking on Bitcoin. It's playing at facets until next Thursday. I'm seeing it tomorrow. Oh, interesting. Yeah, is it is it a docudrama like Michael Moore's? No, or it's, is a doc, it's a documentary. It's documentary. A, it's a docu they talk to the Winklevoss trends, and they talk to several people involved. Really? Yeah. Wow, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. Banking on Bitcoin. It's also available on demand, too. So you, if you can't make it a theater, you can watch it online. Yeah, good to know. Were you in the sex trade? Cool. All right. Um. Any, all right, excuse me there. Uh, are we be, good? If there are no more questions. <laughs> if there are no more questions tonight, let us give Patrick yeah. Stevens. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Exactly. It really was. Nothing makes Bitcoin a presentation like having Tim Stevens here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 A lot of material for as I carry this forward. Okay. All right. All right. Let's thank Patrick again. Yeah. Now we run into the uh, infamous rebuttal period here. How many are going to have rebuttals tonight? All right. We'll just make it an arbitrary five minutes each. As long as you want. What? Yeah, as long as you want. Yeah. Well, okay, so be a couple. If, if they can do the mathematical formula, if they can do the mathematical formula, all right, let's uh, let's get our first rebutter up here and get him started, please. Yeah, who's rebutting? How can you? I don't know. Let's walk away. You don't know much about the subject. Okay, come on up. We've run out of rebuttal. We'll give you about five, six minutes, and then go ahead. And no, I'm not going to go on Oh, he's getting his stuff. So All right, so we'll start up soon. you got to have an opinion on this. Go. We'll just make it six minutes, okay? Take, take the time you need. Rare, rare event here, but go ahead.
When you're down to your last penny, you see it for what it really is. Just a coin when a hundred equals paper, and trees are the only paper who live. When you're down to your one cent, you start to see it what it truly is. Just a mirage in search of yearning souls, and we know that's all it's ever been. When you're down to your one only, you get to know why the house always wins. Just like an ad wasted more of our time. Scream and be afraid, don't act, just stare and sit. When you're down to your last page, you learn how propaganda's got it rigged. We know what we write on it makes it a song, and what the bank writes is just another sales pitch. When you're down to your last Lincoln, you know in your soul what those whispers wish. It's a call to action, Abe's not the same, without the struggle of Frederick Douglass. And that's my rebuttal. Thank you to the speaker. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to go uh, learn what uh, Charles was talking about. You know, why is the, why is the computing uh, power make, make the money, or why is, why is it using computing power? It's using, a, it's using a very complex formula, which takes, uh, say, your average desktop computer, it take it take it weeks to solve it. So uh, typically people, when you solve the problem, you get Bitcoins. And typically the people who make Bitcoins, which is called mining, have a room full of computers that just solve this problem all the time. And every week they get maybe you know, a few Bitcoin to maybe a few hundred, depending on how much computing power they got. So the reason is this restricts supply, because money is basically supply and demand. If you're strict, if you got something that's very hard to get and a very small supply, it is valuable no matter what it is. You know, food, money, gold, everything. That's one reason gold's valuable, is because it's hard to get, you have to mine it. And there's only a limited amount of it. So Bitcoin's basically taking the same principle and making it digital. So I, did, I just wanted to try to explain that to you. I mean, you, you have any questions about it or? I think you put it very well. Okay, yeah. oh, from my perspective, I'm talking to Charles. Charles, Charles, Charles. I would say put it very well. Yeah, he's right behind you. Yeah, it's a security thing. I mean, yeah. It's a, like you said, a counterfeiting. Yeah, it's Ballad. also to prevent counterfeiting because in order to do counterfeiting, you'd have to do all this math, and it's like, you know, a big uh, blockchain, it's like you got a chain of, say, hundreds of transactions, you'd have to calculate it uh, hundreds of times, and there's not enough computing power in the world to do that. So. Let's say you solve the problem. Yep, you get a bit, you get some bitcoins. But do you have any privilege as a result, and for how long until? What is the longest time between solving the problem? Depends on how much computing power you have. Well, in general, on bitcoin. I mean, is it? Well, it used to be easy because the, pro the, the problem there's a limited amount of bitcoins, and basically you're basically going through trillions and trillions of numbers trying to find them and there's tr when there's a lot of them you could find them relatively easy and then uh, lately it's been getting a lot harder to find them because most of them have been found so it's basically a mathematical formula and you go through it and you find one it's like there's you know uh, what is it, 21 million of them you said there will be. yeah there will be there's 21 million total and you've got to find them by using mathematical calculations I would add that this is a kind of problem that can be calibrated such that it generally will take about 10 minutes to solve. Yeah. And based on the amount of computers in the world that yeah. are busy trying to solve it. They have a formula that actually determines the difficulty that is required oh. to get yeah. it at yeah. 10 minutes apart based on what the processing power is. Yeah, it depends on the computing. And the computing yeah. power is getting oh, more, so. Yeah. It's like an arms race. The other thing is, is like, you have to, as part of the process of doing this arbitrary legwork and submitting your history of your transactions, there's also uh, actually validating that all those transactions are legitimate, which takes a very minute fraction of that time of the processing power. It's also like an important step, and then there's actually a, a reward for doing so. But in theory, once all Bitcoins are minted, that will be a fairly arduous task. <coughs> there is like a transaction fee associated with that that is given to the to facilitate yeah, yeah. the resources required. Yeah, Bitcoin's a problem. It's 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 very hard to solve the problem, but it's very easy to validate it. Yep. So there's a lot there's mathematical formulas that you can 
takes a while to get to the answer. Once you get the answer, you can easily tell it's the right answer. So that's the type of problems that Bitcoin is. It will be, it will be curious to see how well um, Bitcoin scales after it does after every Bitcoin has been minted, though, because yeah. the incentive will be significantly lower because you'll simply be operating on transaction fees, and to get those transaction fees, you have to expend quite a lot of electricity. Yeah. It's so. the same point, though, with the, the amount of coins that are minting decreasing relatively well, like every year, getting cut in half, mm -hmm. or every two years getting cut in half, I mean, by the time you get to 2040, it's going to be pretty minute anyway. <clears throat> so as, as you said, <clears throat> the shift, the incentive will have to shift from mining fees to transactional fees. And yeah. That'll be a big test for Bitcoin, whether it can survive that shift. You may just end up looking like Visa or MasterCard. At that point, you don't know. Well, the other thing is, is early in the project, they, they actually uh, experimented with min minimal transaction fees based on your transaction amount, so like having a percentage or a minimum mm -hmm. amount. And uh, that wasn't actually liked very much and also had a lot of degradation on resources, basically. So they did away with it. Hmm. It would be interesting to see if they have to end up implementing it again. Because like, you know, when they originally brought the project out, it, that was the theory, that you had to have a system like that in order to facilitate it and incentivize long term. But they ended up removing it, so. Hmm. Okay, why don't you two come on up and tell us a little more about Bitcoin? There you go. Yeah, you two. Come on up and rebut a little more. Tell us a little bit more and talk about it. I'll I'll give a rebuttal. Let me give a rebuttal. Go right ahead, Charlie. Guys, I haven't got. Well, you guys want to go on or? Yeah, please. I don't have much to say other than things to get less. But let's thank our speaker. Maybe I can get a few more questions out of these guys. When they take over here, I've had to suffer through any number of programs here at the College in Economics, but I, I have no aptitude for the subject or interest in it. I'm, I'm a socialist, uh, commie, and I think uh, uh, that's why you're a the socialist. The banking community is, you know, should be subject to arrest and incarceration <laughs> for no, making yes. no contribution to society. Nevertheless, I've heard this thing about fiat money. I've heard something here that's not accurate. Um, and I know the libertarian positions and views on this. I've heard them a multitude of times. Uh, the money of the United States is in fact backed not by some standard like gold or silver or whatever. It's, back, it's the U.S. economy that is backing up the value. The investment of the United States economy to produce goods or services instead of this gold standard. Uh, and it seems since the 70 to work just as well. And quite frankly, I think that's more of a contemporary way of assessing the value of money is based on the economy of the country that's producing that money makes perfectly good sense to me. Um, the uh, other arguments we've heard is the, the Federal Reserve. Uh, from what I understand, it, it operates pretty independently of politics without any de excessive degree of corruption or controversy. It operates with a, some immunity from politics, which is probably good. Um, so, to say I'm going to use some currency that has nothing to do with government, uh, that's called the black market. It's an underground economy. Uh, you may be doing it out here, but it does have features clandestine features uh, inherent to it. Um, it's out of the control of government. I am not averse to government control of economies. Uh, there's some other things I really don't understand their function or purpose, but there are such things as International Monetary Fund. Uh, uh, the only thing I know about it is I passed the building 
to my office in Washington where they're headquartered. I go to their bookstore, but they do have certain international functions in terms of the economy is no longer obviously isolated in one country. Um, I don't know about setting up your own monetary system, though I guess in essence every bank or checking account or credit card is something along that nature. If this is something like that, I think claiming it to be money, uh, I think this wild fluctuations, the one thing there the most slide is, uh, what, why in anyone in their right mind would embrace a currency which has such, subject to such weather conditions uh, and you can't ascertain its value. Uh, that's been the complaint in countries historically from what I understand due to inflation and why you would knowingly, it seemingly you showed a chart that it has achieved no stability and again, you didn't do anything that they're going to do to change it to achieve stability. So I guess you could do it and hope you're, I, 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 I don't know if you really want, it sounds like, like gambling. Does, are you going to win on this? I believe it looks like you may lose. Uh, so I don't understand without, I mean, the, the one thing people want regarding monetary things, I think, not to sound like a Trump voter, is, <laughs> well, I don't want it to, you know, I don't want it to change, you know. Uh, it's extreme fluctuations, you know. It's uncertainty, and I think uh, that's when people lose trust in any system. And until you can overcome that, I, I don't know. But anyhow, let's hear from our two guys over there. Yeah, Thank you on, very man. much, Jill. It's still how to buy a woman. It's a, how many bitcoins for a woman? Oh, yeah. So, oh, boy. Okay. First, first question to you two. Have you guys used bitcoin? Yes. What do you find is the most advantageous usages for bitcoin? Uh, I think online traction, uh, transactions are just as easy as using a credit card with Bitcoin. Especially with the technology and the companies that have come up, I really made it quite easy, really. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's where the currency currently really excels is in um, online transactions, operating similar to how you would with uh, credit cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, like I was talking about, um, he alluded to the, we were making a joke earlier, because I recently went to Portland, Oregon for work, and it's a very interesting place because pretty much every every uh, restaurant, store, um, everything uh, takes Bitcoin. Um, and the way that they do that is there's actually a company there that basically when you still you initiate a transaction and they do a price freeze, right? And they say, okay, for the next 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we're going to conduct this transaction, as long as it's successful, it's going to happen at this price. Now they win some and they lose some because of that, that fluctuation that he's talking about. Um, so it's interesting that you can, you know, it's so, it's not a static value, like a $20 bill is always worth $20 because the government says so. Which creates a whole other set of economic conditions, I guess, that really inevitably determine the value of items and things. But at the same time, Bitcoin has no absolute value. It, no one is saying that it's worth a certain amount of anything. It's literally people coming together and saying, I want to use this system for whatever means, right? whatever reason they have, and they're assigning a value to it. Saying, I'm trading my US dollars that has a static value. right? So one Bitcoin, the ability to use it or invest in it or whatever purpose you want is worth to me a thousand US dollars. As the platform gains adoption, theoretic and uh, supply and demand stabilize. Theoretically, the currency sh value should stabilize. Yeah, to a degree. Yeah. So if I look in the toy store window and I see a lion out train for ten bitcoins, and I start saving my money, I could conceivably go to the store and 
and give them 10 bitcoins and the guy's going to say, oh, I'm sorry, Chuck, it's 35 now. Is this well, what you're telling me? I mean, it would be no different than the store well, increasing, in, you know, inflation causing an increase in, you know, your coffee that you order every day for, you know, 20 years. Is that is the coffee that you ordered 20 years ago the same price as it is today? I imagine not. But but the value the value of Bitcoin is based on like like the price fluctuation can go every day just based on the value up and down, correct? Yeah, it's, it's, it's based on the what people are willing to pay at individual exchange. The other thing that's interesting is exchanges are set up exchanges will actually traditionally have rates that are different, right? I could go if I want to trade in some of my Bitcoin, right, for US dollars, right? Again, there's no central system that says even that this one Bitcoin is worth $900. Now, there's lots of, well, you know, renowned, you know, economists and things that have come up with formulas or you can use the traditional ones from, you know, the normal stock market to determine based on supply and demand what the price should be. However, that's not necessarily always the case. And you can go to exchanges quite regularly and see quite a difference in price, maybe a couple dollars. I mean, one day I actually saw you go to one major exchange, you know, say it's $900. You go to another major exchange, it's $920, right? And then you have people changing between exchanges to try to make money, things like that. But I mean, it's all about what people are willing to pay, what their value of it is, as opposed to what any individual party says it is. Right? Then it gives you that power to make those transactions. So in other words, it's a lot more reflective of the pricing mechanism that capitalism is used for, more representative of the value of a good or service, correct? Yeah, and there you get to, when you're talking about, I guess, holistically economics, right? you're getting closer to the actual value that someone observes, right? Mm -hmm. So like, um, I watched an interesting video of Christmas and they were talking about how it's inevitably a bad idea for people to buy gifts because you buy me like a pair of socks. You might have paid $10 for those socks, but I might think that I would only pay six. So in all reality, the market as a whole has lost $4 of value, right? That's, that's how economics works. Well, in theory, using Bitcoin, since there is no central authority that says this is what everything's worth, right? you get closer to realizing that full value potential. All right. How easy is it to use Bitcoin at, say, the retail level? What exactly do you do? So, um, I mean, personally, what I would do is I would say, it's. I, I mean, everybody kind of make transactions online. Like, I always think like PayPal, right? Right. PayPal is like a... It really, they do the same thing. You can give the retailer your credit card information, or you give PayPal your credit card right. information, <clears throat> and then sign into PayPal, right? Mm -hmm. So in most sites, like Overstock.com, for instance, right? There's one he has listed on here. Right. That was one of the earliest adopters. In all reality, it's pretty much the same thing as like making a PayPal purchase these okay. days. They have set up with another, you know, third party, or basically you say like, okay, I want to pay with Bitcoin. It's just a button you click, like it's, I want to pay with PayPal. Same thing, click your button log in, or you know, if you don't have an account with that particular third party that's doing that processing for them, then you, you know, they give you some steps, basically send uh, Bitcoins from your wallet, which is kind of how you house all of your mm -hmm. coins you own, to them. And then once that processes, once you get the authorization for the network, I mean, they ship you your goods. What about like at, at a restaurant or something? How would you use it there? So that's a... Like I said, that's a different thing that there, again, companies have come out. I just say the most common way to do it is price freezing. So that's the thing that we had when I was, I was talking about in Portland. You go to a restaurant, <coughs> they had a company that was located in Portland that kind of pushed it, right? they do a price freeze, I'd pay them um, that amount. They'd pay the restaurant, usually in US dollars or Bitcoins, whatever they chose, that mark, that uh, value that was locked in, right? But, I mean, would you like to have a have smartphone to yeah. do that? Um, it depends. A lot of people in Portland have hardware tokens, which is like a little device you can carry that allows you to do a lot of it. It's like, that was a comment about lo losing power, I know you left uh, earlier, but there are hardware tokens that have like 10-year battery lives that you can do most transactions on as well. 
So a lot of people in Portland have those. Uh, but yes, or the, the alternative would be use your smartphone. So you just like show them a token or so something on your it's smartphone? Like a, it's usually like a barcode or QR code. Ultimately, you would still need power. Yeah, right? you need because some you need to actually you know compute the transaction. Yeah. So. so you need some digital device to send what you have to them, okay. or in this case, usually a third party who would then, you know, just like you know, Square. Again, Square does like U.S. dollars, U.S. dollars, but in this case, it's a third party like them that's doing Bitcoin to U.S. dollars. I mean, usually, I, I, I think where you know it will probably go is to something similar to you know what you have with uh, say Apple Pay. Okay. Um, you know, I can I have my credit card loaded into my phone, and I just hold it near the card reader, and mm -hmm. the um, information regarding my my card is securely um, transmitted to the uh, card reader, and then it's shipped over to the payment processor. Um, I think we're probably going to see things similar to that, um, but for Bitcoin. Okay. In your own words, since this is going out on YouTube, why should we use Bitcoin? Yeah, why? I don't see any reason to. I mean, uh, I guess for me personally, I think it, it's, I don't know how to explain it, okay. So I, I, I like that it's more, there's more anonymity, there, but at the same time there's, yeah, everything's up front, right? Um, traditional banking, they make a lot of money off of basically farming out your transactions and then you get all these advertisements for it and stuff. It's it's a whole industry that's built around kind of what you are, right? You can characterize an entire person based on what they buy, where they go shopping, things like that. It's kind of crazy if you think about it. But with, with Bitcoin, there's no context around what you're purchasing. It's literally kind of like a phone call. I did this, right? I wanted, I sent this to this person, from this person to this person, this much money. It was validated. It's a legitimate transaction. You can't get much context around that. You don't even know what I'm buying. You don't know who these two entities are necessarily. You make assumptions based on past transaction history or associations with entities that you do know, but you're not. There's no absolute correctness to it. Whereas, you know, a bank has to say, "This is me. This, these identifiers are me," right? Uh, and then also, I think it's it's pretty easy to use in general. I mean, I know I kind of a kind of a tech nerd, but right. I think it is a lot easier to use, um, and there's a lot more of them, I would say, more modern security features that I, would, I, mean, we, I, I mean, I would honestly like to see in banking, you know, be adopted in traditional banking even, um, or yet play in Bitcoin, so. Yeah, I, I think probably one of the, the most um, advantageous features of, of Bitcoin is the decentralization of it. Um, I, I would disagree um, a bit with um, the usability of Bitcoin. I think that it is making significant strides, but I think that um, for the general public, there's still a lot of, um, it's difficult to um, actually get into utilizing Bitcoin and using it as a currency if you don't have any ex experience with it or experience with the platforms that support Bitcoin. So. I think I, I think that that's hurting adoption right now. I think that we'll we'll see companies um, provide better solutions, more robust solutions that are um, easier for your average consumer to adopt. But I don't think that we're quite there yet. I think there's a lot of companies that have come out that have really bridged a lot of gaps in usability. I think the problem is is <clears throat> trust, right? There's a problem of trust because. Here's something that I want to fully control is my money, right? And then all this, a lot of this information is publicly available. And then on top of that, I'm being asked, you know, if I want to simplify this, I want to make this easier on me, I have to trust some other person or some other entity or program to do a whole bunch of this stuff for me, right? And obviously someone else writes that code, someone else controls those systems, things like that. So I think if, you, if you're willing to trust an entity to go in and say, okay, set up my wallet, you know, set up all these things for me, let me purchase Bitcoins. I mean, in like three or four clicks, you can have your credit card information in there, you can buy a whole bunch of Bitcoins and they'll house it for you and everything, but, right? But you have to trust that everything is gonna go right and those Bitcoins <coughs> even exist, right? Because they might just be lying to your face. Like, oh, you just paid, you know, $4,000 for four Bitcoins and they're just showing you, there's four, four of them in your account, 
but do they are they really? Did you really just buy? You know, it's like there's a lot of trust that you have to instill if you use one of those and systems, but I, they do exist. I think that in addition to trust, there is the security aspect of it. I think it, um, you know, by design, Bitcoin has a lot of security features uh, built in, but um, I would say that most of the population is used to taking their money to a, a bank where it's insured and they know that the bank is going to take care of their money. Um, with Bitcoin, you don't have that. You have a, you know, a secret key that is your Bitcoin wallet that holds all of your Bitcoins. And, um, you know, say I invite Mike over to my house and I don't have my computer secured and Mike gets access to my secret key, he effectively has my Bitcoin wallet with, you know, my $10 of Bitcoins or hundreds of thousands of dollars of Bitcoins. And so I think that um, Bitcoin transfers the security uh, substantially to um, the end user because it doesn't have um, a central organization to actually manage security for you. So you have to be significantly more conscious about what you're doing with your Bitcoin, how you're storing your Bitcoin. And um, I think that, that there's some ambiguity around that um, that is uh, getting in the way of adoption. Yeah. Sounds like what you're saying is there's more autonomy coming to one's financial identity, if I'm understanding you correctly, the way you're describing it. Like there's more democracy now in currency because of Bitcoin, in a sense. Yeah, I guess. But like you said, it exactly. requires more trust, and that's a part of any good democracy, more trust. Yeah, I mean, blockchain inevitably mm -hmm. has this side effect of a web of trust, right? When you're building a chain, you're basically building a chain of trust at the same time as you're building transactions, right? Because I'm, I'm allowing people to process those transactions and then add them, right? And I, the trust that I'm instilling in them is that they're doing this arbitrary work, right? Who would do all this work, expend all this money, energy, and time if they're not true into intent, right? And the other thing that I keep in mind is it's, we're talking about processing power that's not a single computer, right? If I put my, I mean, I have a pretty good computer at home, you know, I'm an avid gamer. I put that thing to work, you know, I, it would be probably four or five years before I invented it. Well, I answered, like, successfully answered a block and minted coins. That's entirely impractical. I mean, you're talking about probably $100 uh, a month in electric <coughs> bills around here, you know? <laughs> just, just to hopefully make, you know, a, co a few coins in a few years. And the difficulty is only increasing. Yeah, it's all you know, increasing. It, it used to be that you could take your average, you know, computer that you use for gaming and actually make money mining bitcoins now you're really gonna basically be at a wash uh, between the electricity and the the bitcoins that you're going to be returning yeah, your 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 computer you're gonna pay hundreds of dollars in electrical bills and your computer is probably gonna catch on fire before you mint any bitcoins so in other words you have to have a data center or server mm. farm to well, do it so yeah. really what um contributed to the uh the increase in the difficulty of mining bitcoins is that people made um application specific computers that were designed to just mine bitcoins whereas you have you know um, the everyday computer that's designed to do lots of things you know it runs your operating it runs windows or linux or you know mac and it you know browses the web for you and it'll play games and it'll do all of these you know more general computations whereas you have these com these computers that started to be created that are specifically designed for mining bitcoins and only mining bitcoins and so they're significantly um, more performant um, when it comes to actually performing those computations. And so um, everyone who was getting by just fine on their everyday computers um, can no longer do so because these other computers are substantially better at mining Bitcoins no, and performing those transactions. No. Yeah, and significantly, significantly more efficient from an electricity perspective. The dollar is universally accepted, I believe, as currency around the world without issue. Not, not in all it, countries. Which countries? I mean, I went to Venezuela. You cannot use the U.S. dollar in Venezuela. You have to exchange it. It's actually illegal to carry no, U.S. money may, into the country. Some, yeah. the, in the real world, the dollar is accepted <laughs> as, a, as a solid... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> in other countries, they transfer their money because they got goofy money, and they don't want goofy money, they want American money. And I don't understand why if you're residing in a country 
that has a stable currency accepted around the world, I have no incentive for switching it to this hell. If, if I lived in a country that had questionable currency, and I know about socialized Venezuela, because there's some rules there. Yeah, yeah. In, in the real world, you show you American money, okay. there's no issue. Um, so, but why, if you're in the United States, do you have an issue with American currency when the rest of the world doesn't? So one of the interesting things that I like about the internet is it's international, right? So we can buy stuff all over the place. I buy stuff overseas all the time. I wish more international vendors would accept Bitcoin because I don't know about you guys, but you buy something like euros and then you end up paying like 4% or more oh. on it. It's <coughs> painful. Um, and so one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is the transaction fees, even if you pay them, <coughs> even though there's, there's some ways to get around it, but even if you pay them, right, you're talking about a half a percent, one percent. So it's automatically, it's already cheaper, right? I get my money from US dollars to Bitcoin, and then it's accepted. Or even if I pay that transaction fee again to go to euros, I'm still only at like 2%. I'm still lower than that you know, 4 or 5% that a, a traditional bank might, cost, it might charge me. Um, so that's so one thing. I and have then, to do this if I'm buying stuff overseas. No. This is your, I'm going to well, do this. Yeah, so um, I, I, it's something that I've done. I, yeah. I really don't buy a lot of stuff on high or from overseas, but you're saying that's the real reason? Well, I think in essence you can get lower transaction fees in general. I don't like so. shit from China. Um, and the other thing is, is now, now you have states that are charging sales tax or <laughs> arbitrary yeah. tax on tax and You're not going to relate it with bitcoins, I don't believe. Well, so here's the thing. Um, so right now, you go to Amazon, you're going to pay, I think, like 4.5% to get something shipped here locally in Chicago as a tax that's Illinois implemented. Right. Right. So, um, if, however, I was able to pay Amazon today in Bitcoins, there is no law on the books that says they have to charge that tax. Now, is that a risk that Amazon's willing to take that the government won't come after them? Probably not. But at the same point, I'm sure some retailers would. And there you go. There's a 4% savings just from using Bitcoins. Again, you might have to pay that 1% or so transact percent transaction fee to get your money in. Um, but there's also ways to get around transaction fees. For instance, there's this whole concept of a brain, or uh, not a brain wallet, but um, what it's called, the brain tree, right? Brain tree is a huge project by PayPal. Um, started the the guy that PayPal basically hired. He started actually in the Bitcoin space, where he all he was doing was pairing people up together who wanted to move money across wait, borders. Wait a second. The same laws on sales tax that apply to Bitcoin, I would presume apply to U.S. currency. It depends how the law is written. There's no, there's no difference if you're going to have to end up paying for okay. it. All right. I it think... Not, if it, either you're going to pay it or you're not. And it doesn't matter what the currency is. Okay. So that... that okay. Are you guys uh, satisfied? Do you have anything you want to say before we uh, move on to the next person? Let's yeah, thank. Just, let's unless go, ahead, else go, has ahead, go ahead. Yeah. You think uh, what are the chances of Zoros making his billions by buying low and selling high? Um, I'm pretty good. I would say people could. If you if you really micromanaged it, um, you could probably make a lot of money riding the lows and highs. This there is absolutely nowhere near stable though. And the other thing is, is there's people that have lots of bitcoins. No, but he he had to pay dollars to buy the yen when it was low, mm -hmm. and you cannot use no money to buy bitcoins. So he won't be able to bid on buying the bitcoin low and then selling it for high. No, you'd have to do usually to make money off of you know riding the waves as they call it, right? Of bitcoins. I mean, it would probably shift $20, $30 a day easily. 
So if you want to make money on that, you, you're doing transactions multiple times a day as it goes up and down. Okay. And then you have to keep in mind that there are, <coughs> since there is no centralized authority again, there are people who own large percentages of the population of Bitcoins because most of them are early adopters and some of them are heavy investors. Nonetheless, they own like you know, a few percentage of the Bitcoins that exist. So if they buy or sell huge quantities of Bitcoins, okay. it's going to shift the whole market, it's fan structure. All right, I'd like to, uh, I, I, I don't think we're going to have any more rebutter. So Patrick, if you want to give out your last word, take a five, 10 minutes to uh, wrap things up. We'll get out of here and let's thank you, Mr. Dyer. A little, little different in our rebuttal period, but I think they provided valuable information. Patrick, it's no, all yours. I would call it invaluable information. I learned a lot just by listening to the feedback and comments here. I do want to comment on a couple things specifically. All right, Charlie, one pool at a time. Oh, uh, Charles, you did ask why would you use Bitcoin? And actually, as the dialogue unfolded, I think you kind of answered your own question. Here in the US, we don't gain as much benefit from Bitcoin as people in a lot of other countries do. And also, Charles, you pointed out the graph that I showed about the price of Bitcoin. It went way up, way down, huge peaks and valleys. Well, if you looked at a graph of the US dollar, it would be a fairly flat curve. But there are plenty of currencies around the world where the graph would look just like the graph I showed. The Greek currency, currencies in South America, yeah. those, the people in those countries are just yearning for a stable currency and they don't have one. And even though Bitcoin is not quite stable, as was pointed out, it has a great chance to ultimately become stable. The more ubiquitous it becomes, the more stable it will become. Uh, so yeah, here in the US, we have plenty of ways to very efficiently and very conveniently spend our money. Another item was brought up, the specialized machines, the application-specific integrated circuits. That is an advent that drove the home miner out of the Bitcoin business. It used to be fun and interesting to be a Bitcoin miner, but again, as people realized, oh, these things may be worth something, they applied more and more computing power and it became kind of an arms race. And now, really, <clears throat> the only practical way to get into mining is to just become part of what's called a mining pool. You sign up, you pay a monthly fee, and in theory, you're supporting the mining operation consisting of thousands of computers. And then every time they win some Bitcoins, you get a fraction of that, depending upon how much you pay them each month. So it's really just most of the, the computing power is among a small set of really conglomerates doing the mining. And as I said before, most of them have most of their infrastructure sitting in China because of the cost of being able to run that over there. I did see an interesting anecdote on somebody who was talking about the application specific machines. You know, just a small box, all it does is try and solve this mathematical problem. And he was talking about the electricity it uses, as you, as you referenced. And he, he pointed out that this machine was so power intensive that he put it into his garage to run in the middle of January. And his uninsulated garage was running at 80 degrees <laughs> in the middle of January because of this application specific device. That's the arms race that has built up around Bitcoin to try and solve these mathematical problems. I actually saw a, uh, a picture on Twitter the other day of a guy who had a garage, an insulated garage full of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Sure it was, but there was like a foot of snow around it, and then like three feet away from this garage, and all you know, roofing everything just melted. melted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can believe it. I can, I can believe it. So you know, whether it succeeds or not, whether it gains ubiquity and legitimacy, uh, it's yet it's yet to be told. But it has been one of the most interesting advents in the intersection between technology and finance that I have ever seen. Um, a lot of thought, provocation, a lot of trying to predict the future and the impact, and certainly an example of what genius can do 
in just combining technologies that are at our fingertips every day. Tim? Thank you, Patrick, and uh, just go ahead and dismiss us. All right, well, we're all dismissed. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.